Welcome back. Uh, this is Intro to Physical Anthropology. I am your instructor, David Leitner, and today we are going to be talking about um, how, how do you know how big a brain is? What does that even tell you? Uh, we're going to focus on something called encephalization quotient, uh, and then we're going to look at the history of the evolution of the human brain uh, in the hominin tribe. And, uh, and see if we can draw some conclusions about what forces, what, what traits of those brains were actually being selected for at various times, uh, and what encephalization quotient can tell us about that. So, without further ado, okay, so, yeah, we have big brains, but what's that even mean? Typical volume of the human brain is anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 cc's. It can be a little more, maybe 16. I've seen 17 listed some places, but you get the picture. There's there's sort of a, a main range that we're in. The average is about 1,350. Um, however, if you look at a sperm whale, its brain is 8,000 cc's. Okay, that's significantly larger than our brain. So we don't have a larger brain than a sperm whale, and yet we do all these things that we think of as intelligent uh, that sperm whales don't. I'm not saying they're not intelligent, they're very intelligent, but what is, you know, if brains have something to do with behavior, what what is the difference between these brains that produces these different behaviors? So the problem is that Absolute brain size is a very poor indicator of how brains are actually working, what they actually do. Instead, we rely on something called encephalization quotient. Now, the encephalization quotient, or EQ, is the actual brain size divided by the expected brain size. I'll come back to what that means in a minute, but just for now, understand that it's just a ratio. Okay, it's a, it's a division problem. That's it actual to expected. If you have an EQ greater than one, then the brain is bigger than what you would expect for a creature that size. If it is smaller than one, then it, then it has a brain that is smaller than you would expect for a creature that size. And the degree to which it's either larger or smaller than what you would expect can tell you a little something about how much emphasis evolution has put on evolving that brain structure. Because here's the thing, when evolution selects for larger body sizes, brains usually scale up as well. So during natural selection, what we want to ask isn't just our brains getting bigger, but is evolution selecting for brains that are brain, larger brains faster than it's selecting for larger bodies? That tells us then that brain, that there's something about the brain that is being selected for, rather than just being a side effect of overall body increase. So this is what I mean by um, expected bo uh, brain to body ratio. There's a sort of logarithmic scale here that um, is drawn using basically an average of a whole bunch of different species uh, EQs. So um, brains typically are a certain percentage of a species body mass. And that is what this line represents. This would be the typical. This is sort of the average here. Um, the dots, however, show you that very few organisms actually exist right on that line. Dogs, right on the line. Dogs are great. Uh, horses, just slightly below that line. Moles, kind of right on that line. Mice, kind of right on that line. But hippopotamus, way below the line. Okay, sperm whales, significantly below the line there. Elephants, we think of them as really intelligent, but they're right on the line there. Dolphins, way above the line, humans way above the lines, chimpanzees kind of below humans, and so forth and so on. You can see all the primates on this scale are above the line. That's typical of most primates. 
Um, you can see these brain to body ratios in the EQ, uh, even better, uh, when you look at it this way. Um, the EQ for a human is 7.44, so that is considerably above one. <laughs> so we have much bigger brains than you would expect for our body size. Dolphins come in next, then chimps, elephants, dogs, horses, mice. Mice only have a an EQ of 0.5, so they are significantly below the expected, uh, even though they're not that far. I wish they'd put shrews on there. That would be an even smaller number. Okay, now, I've been talking about EQ as a sort of proxy for intelligence, but we have to be very careful here because there are other factors that might be at play that produce um, high EQ. Um, if there are strong selective pressures for smaller body size without the brain necessarily reducing, uh, which happens can happen a lot, um, then you end up with a higher EQ. So... Uh, while, um, chihuahuas and, um, and collies are probably not that different in terms of gross intelligence, they can both learn tricks, they can both, you know, some people argue collies are smarter than your average dog, but they're sort of in the same ballpark, but the, uh, chihuahua has a much higher EQ because more of its body mass is in its brain. That's only because it was bred to select for small body sizes, generation after generation, without necessarily shrinking the brain. The, brain, the genes that shrink the brain didn't go along with it. Um, squirrel monkeys are another example. They have very small body sizes, but maintain a, rel a relatively large brain compared to their body size. Uh, but they don't demonstrate a great deal of increased intelligence beyond what we, would, we expect from them. Another interesting artifact of this means that in species that have high degrees of sexual dimorphism, uh, females will have higher EQ than males, which is going to make some of you very happy. But like I said, this isn't necessarily a proxy for intelligence there. That is just telling us that there were certain factors selecting for either larger or smaller body sizes um, based on sex in the species, uh, and we are only sort of moderately sexually dimorphic, so. All right, so what does this mean in terms of brain evolution? Well, let's take a look. If we look at, if we use the fossils we have as a proxy for brain size, and again, there's a big asterisk there. The fossils are not a complete record of the past, but they do give us some idea. So they might show us general trends. So what do we see? Uh, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, uh, early Homo and the, um, and the Australopithecines, we actually have very few um, crania that are complete enough we can make uh, uh, volume estimations, right? Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about afferensis, we've got using two specimens, we come up with an average cranial capacity of 450, but the range is of those two, you know, one's down around 400, one's down, up around 500. So who knows? Maybe, maybe the 500's an aberration and their average is much closer to 400. But for now, we will use that. So that's an estimated EQ of 1.87. Uh, as we get more recent, especially with Homo erectus, because they were so widespread, uh, archaic Homo neanderthals and, uh, ancient modern humans, so older than about 8,000 years on this chart, uh, we have more specimens so we can get some more reliable numbers. Uh, and you'll notice that, you know, although, you know, although evolution is not a stepladder, right, where each species succeeds the next, we do have these sort of stages that sort of follow along. And if you line them up, you know, the most recent uh, species to appear, modern Homo sapiens, also has the largest uh, EQ, uh, followed next by Neanderthals. But again, remember, Neanderthals have small bodies, so maybe that is artificially increasing their EQ, uh, but it's not that far off, so probably not that big a deal. Um, let's chart this out. This uses a slightly larger uh, sample set um, than the previous one, but 
it is showing a similar thing, but charted across time. So we've got cranial capacities uh, and millions of years ago, the present being right around here, okay, or roughly. Okay. Um, the different colors represent different uh, groups of species, and the different shapes are the individual species. So we've got three main phases here. The first phase is largely uh, Australopithecines and Paranthropines. Uh, there's a slight increase over this time period of, you know, uh, maybe about two million years, roughly. Uh, but not a lot. You can see here, if we were to try, try and draw a trend line, it would be relatively flat, maybe slightly upwards. Uh, any increases in EQ here that we see will tend to be with the robust Australopithecines, in which case it was more likely because of the, the, the demands for more robust uh, crania that they, the overall cranium grew as well. So we may not be looking at selection for intelligence so much as selection for um, stronger chewing muscles and bones that could support the pressure that they were exerting on uh, with their teeth. The second phase is really sort of early Homo and Homo erectus. Uh, in the beginning, we're talking more, uh, a slightly higher cranial capacity and also EQ than... Um, <clears throat> Australopiths, but not by much. Homo erectus, though, we start to see a steady upwards trend, okay? So over time. Now, again, we have to be careful here. Um, uh, although the, um, although the, the, there is a trend upwards, we also notice body size of Homo erectus increasing over this time period, too. Um, there is some support for the notion that some of this brain increase may represent intelligence. Uh, for instance, this is when we see the first appearance of stone tools, uh, all mostly uh, restricted to genus Homo. There are a few sites where there may be Aldewan tools with Australopithecine remains. Um, but it's possible that 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 is representing a cognitive shift. Uh, with Homo erectus, uh, the, you know, there's this sharp increase after the beginning, uh, partly because of body size. We probably mostly because of body size, because it's a pretty significant body size increase. Finally, we come to the last stage, phase three. Here you've got Archaic Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, anatomically modern humans. We don't have any Denisovan skulls that we can extract. Well, there may have been a discovery recently, I believe, but I don't know if it's been confirmed yet. Um, but, you know, overall, the, the, the fossil evidence for Denisovans is pretty poor at the moment. Um, it's mostly genetic evidence. So all three of these species, however show cranial capacities that at least cross the modern average and falls, you know, much of which falls within the modern human range, right? Um, the, it's hard to distinguish the different species here uh, of different uh, uh, hominins. And here is, th these last two lines are the range for uh, modern Homo sapiens males and modern Homo sapiens females. Uh, and as you can see, there's so much overlap that it's hard to tell any difference here. Uh, that doesn't mean there wasn't. There definitely is. Archaic Homo sapiens definitely tended to have smaller brains than Neanderthals or Homo sapiens. But at this point, that increase is also accompanying significant behavioral changes. Uh, and even the increase from Homo erectus to Archaic Homo is a pretty significant increase. And again, we notice significant behavioral differences uh, as with definite signs of not just hunting, but big game hunting, right? Um, more complex tool technologies, more varied, uh, 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 possibly cultural patterns. So in this case, it seems very likely that... Um, that during this phase, 
intelligence is what was being selected for. But then we've got this sort of weird situation where so modern humans, now they don't have any, uh, they have some ancient Homo sapiens, and you can see they have quite a large range there in the past. Their average is a little bit higher up here. Um, but um, you notice modern Homo sapiens are a little bit smaller cranial capacity. So what are we supposed to make of that? Um, could be sampling bias. It could be that having uh, more males represented um, in the uh, in the fossil record might bring the EQ uh, uh, down, whereas having more females would bring it up. Uh, it could be that there were simply fewer ancestral uh, Homo sapiens to to measure, as you could see before, we only had about, uh, I don't know how many they have on this chart, but it's still only, like, it's less than a couple dozen here. Um, uh, whereas we may have thousands to go on with, uh, with contemporary Homo sapiens. So, you know, that could be, it could just be a, a, the law of large numbers is working and we've just got we don't have enough of a sample to sort of account for the um, uh, the uh, um, the bias there. Um, finally, it's possible we are human chihuahuas. That is to say that the sort of big dog version of us in ancient times has somehow been selecting for smaller bodies um, and smaller brains over time. Uh, why? Um, we do have smaller bodies now than, certainly than early uh, modern Homo sapiens did. Um, it's possible, um, it's possible that there's simply just, a, it's just a trend in evolution, but what kind of trend might that be? Um, we notice that size isn't the only change going on, right? With Homo sapiens, the biggest change is also in the shape of the skull. We've got this sort of general trend of a sort of slight arch with a relatively low forehead in all of the hominins up till Homo sapiens. And then with Homo sapiens, you get these very steep foreheads and a very globularized skull, a very spherical cranium. Um, maybe that is... Uh, representing a change not just in size but in terms of organization the parietal lobes may be changing uh, and accommodating different kinds of functions or working more efficiently um, this is a change we also notice that occurs within the first year of life so by the time a child is one year old this sort of shift to this more globularized uh, brain is already in effect compared to uh, Neanderthal brains. On the other hand, we also have to note that one of the big differences, we see this shift here, right, uh, in about the past eight to 10,000 years. What happened during the past eight to 10,000 years? Agriculture and sedentary lifestyles. It could be that our changing lifestyles have also affected the way our brains grow, not necessarily changing our intelligence, but it might have demanded different kinds of intelligence. Uh, that have subtly shifted us. Now, that doesn't explain why we don't see this change. We see the same change, sorry. We do see the same change in uh, modern hunter-gatherers, though. So, maybe not. Uh, but then again, we're talking about averages. So, if you've got a bunch of, of uh, people living in communities that are malnourished because they're, they're living in early agricultural communities... Uh, and they rely on a relatively few number of crops, then, you know, malnutrition during childhood affects brain development and affects overall brain size as an adult. So it, um, uh, you know, it could be an artifact of these things. Uh, maybe there's something about having higher population densities that has somehow selected for smaller individuals. We we don't know for sure. There are a bunch of different hypotheses that can be tested here. Okay, so let's sort of bring this full circle here and ask, what is the full story here? So 
We've talked about EQ and how important it is not to assume that a larger brain is a more intelligent brain and or that a larger brain is being selected for because it's a larger brain. It may be a side effect of selection for a larger or smaller body. Um, EQ can be a sign of higher intelligence, high EQ can, uh, but it also doesn't necessarily need to be. Uh, chihuahuas. Walk away from this lecture with nothing else, just think chihuahuas. Um, the full story. Early hominin brain change uh, is almost definitely just any changes you see are due to body size. Uh, most of the past two million years, increases in brain size began to outpace uh, body size. And by about 500,000 years ago, actually brain size starts to level out. We've got these wide, wide uh, ranges here. But in fact, when you look at the averages, this curve looks a little more like it levels out at the top here a little bit and then takes a dip into the present time. Uh, finally, a decrease in size in modern Homo sapiens is strange, but there are ways we could try to uh, test. There are hypotheses we can test to uh, explain it. Um, in the next video, I'm going to talk about what may have been selected for. Like what there are lo brains do lots of things. They do so many, so many, so many things. So what things were being selected for once intelligence and larger brains were being s selected for? Um, that does it for now, though. Have a great week. Take care of yourself, and I will see you soon.